Yeah, please start. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and I welcome you all for the next session of this uh, GI and HPB oncology webisode. And as you know, we are um, discussing hepatocellular carcinoma, primary liver cancers uh, in this in these sessions, and we have reached so far. Uh, to the liver directed therapies for HCC. We have covered the anatomy and basic uh, physiology pathology for liver cancers. We have uh, discussed about the surgical aspects and today we are going to discuss the local ablative and liver directed therapies for hepatocellular carcinoma. So the format will be same like a talk followed by a panel discussion. So I welcome all the eminent faculty members for uh, this session today. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll have Dr. Sunil Taneja, who is an eminent hepatologist in ILBS, and he would be delivering a lecture on liver-directed therapies for HCC. Uh, welcome you, sir. Yeah, you can proceed with the talk now. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nikhil and Dr. Shepali for giving me this opportunity. So my job here is to talk about uh, liver-directed therapies for HCC, and I'm going to give an uh, overview of these therapies. Uh, so let me just, um, am I audible and my slides are visible? Just to, let me just confirm this. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I, I will just start with a small case scenario. And this was a case which we have recently encountered and uh, how this case was management and subsequently so that you get an idea about how local regional therapy is used in such patients. So this was a 50 year male patient, diabetic and hypertensive for four years and he was a chronic alcoholic in serogenic doses for the last 20 years, presented with just complaints of loss of weight and uh, loss of appetite. And uh, on examination, he had spinum gale and uh, there were no other positive findings. So once he was investigated for this weight loss and anorexia, he, his platelet count was found to be reduced and albumin was preserved, iron ore was preserved. And when he underwent an endoscopy, he had the grade two viruses. And, alpha fetal protein was just marginally elevated, 17. So he under, also underwent an ultrasound abdomen and which showed a space occupying lesion in the liver, uh, in the right loop of liver. And once a CT scan, triphasic CT scan was done, there was a six centimeter large lesion in the segment five and six with multiple satellite lesions. And uh, so the diagnosis of alcoholic cirrhosis was made in this patient with the multifocal HCC and uh, largest lesion being around six centimeters. He was fitting into BCLC B stage, and I'm going to discuss what is this BCLC B. And he had a CTP score of A, which is that he had a compensated cirrhosis with a low male score. And therefore, he underwent a conventional TACE followed by an uncomplicated course. And uh, uh, at four weeks, imaging studies were repeated, which showed a small residual lesion for which a radiofrequency ablation was done. So, two local regional therapies were done in a single patient. So before I really jump on to the local regional therapies, just giving you an overview of hepatocellular carcinoma, it is the fourth leading cause of cancer-related mortality and local regional therapies are now defined as image-guided liver tumor-directed procedures. And they play a leading part in the management of around 60% of the tumors. The radiofrequency ablation is the mainstay of treatment at early stages and trans-arterial chemoembolization remains the standard treatment for intermediate stage HCC. And there are other techniques which have also evolved over the last decade. That these uh, techniques are microwave ablation, cryoablation, and irreversible electroporation. And two radio embolization and stereotactic body radiation techniques have also been explored and are being used more and more frequently in patients with HCC. But the caveat is that they have not yet modified the standard therapies which are being used, which includes RFA and TACE. And uh, these therapies which were established a decade ago have not been replaced completely by these new therapies, which I have just stated. So whatever local regional therapies or the liver directed therapies which are being used now, they have substantially increased the life expectancy of these patients with HCC and median overall survival is beyond five years at early stages. It's around 20 to 30 months for intermediate stages, and it's around 20 months for advanced stage HCC in patients with well-preserved liver function. So all these therapies which are directed, local regional therapies or even the duct therapies, they work well once the patient has good liver function tests. 
So once the liver disease advances and they become decompensated, then the survival is not very good in these patients. So look at the incidence and mortality of HCC. It is very high in patients who are in Eastern Asia as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa. Overall, the uh, incidence and mortality in HCC is low in India. And the major risk factors which have been seen for HCC include viral hepatitis B and C and alcohol. And the most important cause which is emerging now is NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH cirrhosis. And I think it's becoming the commonest cause of cirrhosis worldwide. And it's going to be the commonest cause of HCC worldwide over a period of time. So before we really jump onto the therapies and treatment, just a review of the diagnosis of HCC. These are the easel guidelines. And if you have a mass or nodule at imaging in a patient who has cirrhosis, you need to do a contrast imaging study. And if you have a classical arterial enhancement with venous washout, you can make a diagnosis of HCC. And if one imaging is not confirmatory, then you need to do a second imaging. And if both the imaging are inconclusive and you have a very, very strong doubt of HCC, then you need to do biopsy in these patients to confirm a diagnosis. So this is by the easel and there is a little differentiation from the American Association for Study of Liver Disease. They have now incorporated LIRADS. LIRADS is liver imaging reporting and uh, data system. And LIRADS 5 is classical of HCC, 1 and 2 might be benign just. And in LIRADS 4, if there is a strong suspicion, then you can do a biopsy and prove your diagnosis. So a little different from what it is there in the easel guidelines. So once the diagnosis of HCC has been made, the next step is to stage the tumor. And there are a lot of staging systems which have been used, but the commonly used now and which has been endorsed by all the societies is the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Staging. And this was the, this, uh, this is the classical uh, staging system which has been used and this was uh, quoted way back in 2008. Uh, this is a very important slide because the whole of the local regional therapies will depend on this BCLC staging. And let me just discuss this in detail. Stage zero is in which the performance status is very good and patients have compensated cirrhosis. And in this you have very early stage in which the single tumor is less than two centimeters. And here, either you can offer resection or ablative therapies. And in early stage, you have single tumor or three nodules less than three centimeters. Again, the performance status is pretty good. The child status is A to B. And if you have uh, three nodules less than three centimeters, either you can do transplantation if they're fit for that, or again, you have these ablative therapies in which ethanol and radiofrequency ablation was suggested earlier. And look at the response rates. A curative treatment around, in around 30% and five-year survival is pretty good, 50 to 70%. The second group is the intermediate stage, which is multinodular uh, tumors. And again, the performance status is pretty good here. And here, the embolization procedures are being used, which include stays and the newly incorporated procedures, which include tear and SBRT also is fitting somewhere into chemoembolization. And here also in early stage tumors, which I will discuss in my subsequent slides. And if you look at the overall results, uh, three-year survival is around 20 to 40%. So if you look at the other stages, the stage advanced stage C or terminal stage D, uh, the, the treatment is primarily with chemotherapeutic agents and uh, survival is not as good as in early stage of the disease. So crux is that you should try and pick up tumors at an early stage where you can offer curative treatment or at least ablative treatments which have a good long-term survival. So let me show you this modification of this uh, algorithm. And this is the recent uh, review which has been published in Nature. Here, they have defined it as very early stage. Again, the same early stage, intermediate, advanced, and terminal stage. And look at the very early stage. Here, they have incorporated ablation as the primary mode of treatment because it has been seen in studies that ablation offers a good survival benefit and it is similar to resection or to transplant also. And in other stages, the treatment modalities remain the same. Either it is ablation for small tumors or it is chemoembolization procedures for intermediate stage tumors. So now there has been a paradigm shift in the management of these patients and look at the systemic therapy which has evolved over a period of time. Number of agents are being tried and the overall survival is improving in these patients. And 
combination with these therapies is being done along with uh, and have shown very good results and these are the number of trials which are going on which uh, and the results are expected soon and i hope that once all the results are available there is going to be a much better survival of patients with hcc so what are the society recommendations let's see the asld puzzle and the easel recommendation this is the asia pacific european and the american guidelines so very early either you can do resection ablation or liver transplant early resection ablation or liver transplantation and intermediate stage is local regional therapy so my talk today will focus on early and local regional therapies primarily and again ablation uh, for resection and liver transplant for early by a puzzle the new thing which they have added here is they have included uh, radiotherapy and sirt in this algorithm which is not seen in other two guidelines so far and uh, easel is similar to what has been recommended by the american association of study of liver so just to give you a summary here small tumor single tumor ablation resection very good results or transplantation again if if it is an intermediate tumor tas tae or tear which i will discuss in subsequent slides if it is advanced and terminal then either you can use drugs or best supportive care so just to summarize all the treatments which are available for hcc right now what is the level of evidence in assessment of benefits in hcc Uh, surgical resection offers increased survival. Again, liver transplants uh, gives uh, better survival. In local regional therapies, RFA or ablation therapies improve survival. And then you have chemo embolization, which have also improved survival and marginal benefit with systemic therapies also there. So, what is the outcome of all these therapies which have been given in resection and in early uh, stages? Uh, you see the survival is around 50 to 70% at 5 years liver transplant also offers very good survival and ablation also a similar survival and when you look at the intermediate therapies uh, intermediate stage tas offers a survival around 30% at 5 years so as compared to the early uh, ablative therapies the survival is poor with the intermediate uh, stage of tumor so coming back to the liver directed therapies in hcc which i am going to discuss in detail i am going to give an overview and indications where and what therapy has to be used so liver directed therapies can be divided primarily into ablation therapies which include chemical ablation for which ethanol and acetic acid has been used then you have thermal ablation which includes rfa which is the primary mode of treatment as i said earlier you have microwave ablation and cryoablation which are new techniques which are being used with equal or i would say a little better results as compared to rfa now and you have non chemical and non thermal technique which is irreversible electrophoresis which is also being used where rfa or microwave or cryoablation is not possible or not being uh, where it cannot be used and when you look at the embolization procedures you have conventional tas or dep tas and then you have uh, trans arterial aerial embolization so the newer therapies which are being tried now are sbrt and there is some data on high intensity focused ultrasound and laser ablation uh, ablation as well so what are the goals of these liver directed therapies obviously we need to have a curative intent and early therapies uh, in early stage of tumors you can offer curative intent to the tune of 30 to 40% uh, the second indication is down staging of tumor to within milan criteria sorry so that the patients can be transplanted as a bridge to liver transplantation to decrease the fallout rate and if the waiting period is more than 6 months you should uh, do a bridging therapy for them and so that they do not fall out of the waiting list and obviously if they are unresectable to improve survival in patients and i have shown you that the survival is pretty good with the therapies which are being offered to these patients now so moving on to radio frequency ablation this is the commonest procedure which is being used as a local regional therapy in patients with hcc in this you have a thin probe which is introduced into the middle of the tumor and then you give this ac current which are delivered through electrodes which cause an agitation of the particles of the surrounding tissue and the energy which is generated by this radio frequency ablation induces coagulative necrosis of the tumor and it also produces a safety ring around it and eliminates small undetected undetected satellites uh, nodules which are there uh, with the primary tumor 
and it has uh, been seen that RFA is effective in 90% of the lesion and can be reached uh, with easy access. Again, it is a no-touch technique and it is a well-established treatment and has been used for uh, more than a decade now. The only problem with RFA is that the heat sink effect limits its efficacy nodules which are close to major vessels. So if it is close to vessels, then the transmission of the heat energy which is being produced by this can be go, it can go to the vessels and cause damage to them. And thermal injury to the adjacent structures can also happen, especially to the gallbladder and the biliary structures. So here, here the limit, these are the limitations of RFA where it cannot be really used. And it is the first line treatment for very early stage disease, as I said earlier. And it is the alternate first line option for patients with early stage disease and survival benefit is similar to that of surgery. Again, it can be used as a combination therapy as I showed you the case that taste plus RFA is recommended for three to five centimeters unsectable HCCs. So look at the response rate, 90% for small HCCs, 60% for medium sized HCC and 24% for large HCCs and local tumor progression rate of around two to 20% at three years. So what are the new innovations for high risk locations, which I said, when it is close to the capsule or it is close to the gallbladder or to the uh, vascular structures. So there are methods which are being evolved. One is to use artificial ascites. And second is again, uh, you can use multi-bipolar probes, uh, which help in thermocoagulation of the tract and protective artificial ascites for critical extrahepatic structures neighboring the target. So just to show you one case, and this is a HCC which was seen in this patient, and uh, uh, this is the arterial phase image, and this is the washout in the venous phase. Uh, the patient underwent RFA, and subsequently on multiple follow-up studies, there was no appearance of a new lesion. So what are the results of outcome? Just to summarize the results, pretty good five-year survival as compared to resection and much better survival as compared to the percutaneous ethanol injection. So percutaneous ethanol injection is hardly being used now and it has been replaced primarily by RFA. Moving on to microwave ablation. Again, this is a thermal technique in which high frequency microwaves uh, lead to polarization and rapid oscillation of the water molecules producing heat and inducing homogeneous heating and coagulation necrosis. Again, this is a larger ablative zone as compared to the RFA. And uh, the potential advantages are that it is less susceptible to heat sink effect and it causes faster heating over large volume and hence potential advantage of simultaneously treating more lesions in a shorter time. Again, it can cause thermal injury to the adjacent structures and size of ablation zone is at times harder to predict because the ablative zone is bigger as compared to RFA in microwave ablation. So example of microwave ablation, this was the tumor which was seen in arterial phase and venous washout in the uh, venous phase. And uh, this is after microwave ablation, a complete ablation at one month and six months of treatment. And what are the results? Overall results, pretty good and comparable to radiofrequency ablation. The survival rates are pretty similar. No additional advantage as compared to uh, RFA and maybe a little, uh, I would say a little more advantage would be that side effects with, will be a little limited with microwave ablation as compared to the uh, radio frequency ablation. So moving on to cryoablation. Cryoablation is based on rep repetitive freeze thaw cycles in which high pressure argon gas leads to cooling of the metallic probe. Here is the probe and by subsequent infusion of the helium gas then causes a warming of the probe and then the thawing of the tissue. And you tend to achieve very low temperatures and these cycles cause cell death by intracellular ice crystal formation, which leads to ischemia by formation of ice crystals within the vasculature. So the important point which is there to highlight is that in cryoablation, real time monitoring of the ablation zones can be seen and it can be used for smaller tumors as well. The only risk and problems with cryoablation is the risk of bleeding and cryoshock, which has been mm, reported in some cases. And advantages over RFA, again, it has a larger ablative zone. And as I said earlier, more clearly discernible treatment margin because there is a ice ball formation seen, which can be seen on imaging. It is less painful and 
there is some data to suggest that it has a stronger ectopic tumor suppression effects obviously there are some complications associated with chiablation tumor seeding and uh, major complications seen in around 5 to 6% of patients and the major adverse effects being cryo shock dic and multi organ failure in some patients which have been reported what are the long term outcomes of cryo ablation pretty good this is a big study of 866 patients and the complete response was seen in 97% of lesions and 96% of patients uh, recurrence rate was around 60% after a median of 30 months and median post cryo ablation overall survival was 77 months which is pretty good so a uh, comparison of cryo with rfa just to show you the study 360 patients and uh, 76% patients had tumor size of 2 to 4 cm and look at the results cryo and rfa were comparable in local recurrence new occurrence overall survival and tumor free survival so both are comparable moving on to the next one irreversible electroporation this is a non thermal ablative method the, all the methods which i have discussed earlier are thermal methods and this is a non thermal ablative method which delivers short electric pulses of high power and intensity between two electrodes it induces definitive pores across the cell of bilipid membrane and uh, leading to cell death mainly by apoptosis and the problem with ir is is that it requires general anesthesia and neuromuscular blockade to start the procedure and contraindications are cardiac arrhythmias and pacemakers and the only advantage which i see over rfa is that efficacy not affected by the heat sink effect and the other uh, problem is that it is available in very few centers in india and pj is one of the centers which is doing irreversible electroporation so as i said this is a non thermal method less risk of injury to the adjacent structures and it is primarily indicated where rfa or microwave or cryo cannot be done and uh, the uh, the the drawbacks of this irreversible electroporation is that there is limited clinical clinical experience as i said only few centers in india have this and cardiac gating is necessary because there is a risk of cardiac arrhythmias and uh, Uh, cardiac deaths because of this procedure so what are the results of irreversible electroporation uh, pretty good results and if you look at the complete ablation rates and uh, after the second and third ire they are pretty good to the tune of 80 to 90% so moving on to the embolization therapies and they can be either trans arterial embolization you have conventional tase and adeptase and trans arterial radio embolization so tase is primarily the principle is occlusion of the arterial blood supply of the lesion by embolizing microparticles and chemotherapeutic drugs and where is tase recommended it is primarily recommended for non surgical patients with tumors which are more than 5 cm or multifocal tumors more than 3 in number the important point to remember is that tumor burden should be less than 50% and there are studies which have shown that if the bilirubin is more than 3 and albumin is low or if the inr is high then the results are not good so you have to look at these reports also before you tell your patients that you can undergo a tase procedure renal functions need to be good and if you have renal dysfunction then this this procedure should not be attempted and you need a good platelet count and you should exclude patients who have high uh, child b or c status and if there is any evidence of main portal vein thrombosis or bilirubin obstruction so this procedure is also used for downstaging of tumors before transplant or as a bridge to transplant so what is the difference between dep tase and conventional tase dep is de uh, drug eluting beads and these are pva based microspheres and range from 75 to 900 uh, micrometer in size and these beads prolong drug delivery time and decrease the systemic toxicity so this is the major advantage of this and it has been seen in few studies that it is it has a superior anti tumor effect and a slightly better safety profile so just to show you an image of conventional tase and this is what this was the tumor which was seen and a super selective cannulation has been done and this is the tumor blush and then after the procedure and this is the lipoidal uptake which can be seen in a conventional tase and this is an example of dep tase uh, here you can see the tumor blush and uh, this is the tumor blush which can be seen and once you do taste this is no arterial enhancement after one year and there's a complete necrosis so what are the contraindications which i said earlier decompensated cirrhosis including any jaundice hepatic encephalopathy or ascites or renal dysfunction 
and if you have impaired portal vein blood flow, and if there is extensive tumor, or if you have malignant main portal vein thrombosis. So these are technically difficult procedures. And if you have the main portal vein thrombosis, then you tend to uh, avoid doing TACE in these patients. And uh, there are certain relative contraindications also if it is a very large tumor and if there are severe com comorbidities and if there is any evidence of biliary obstruction. So what are the results? Overall survival, as I showed you, around 20 to 30% survival at five years with all the uh, procedures which are being done, including TACE plus uh, the other uh, procedures, including RFA or in combination with the systemic therapy. So marginal benefit in survival with TACE and other uh, therapies. Moving on to transarterial radioembolization. Here the principle is that you give beta radiation, which triggers DNA doubling and strands break resulting in tumor cell damage. So this is how it happens. And uh, it is selective internal radiation therapy and it's a minimally invasive procedure, image-guided procedure that delivers intra-arterial brachytherapy to cancer in the liver. The most commonly used uh, radioactive particle is yttrium-90. It's uh, non-biodegradable. It is available in either glass microspheres, which is terraspheres, or it is available in biodegradable uh, resin microspheres, which is sur spheres. And these are the most commonly used radioactive substances. It's a pure beta emitter, which induces direct cytotoxic um, destruction to the target uh, tumor. And there are other uh, molecules which are being used. Uh, rehenium is one and even iodine has also been used. And at PGI, we are using rehenium in place of yttrium and the results have been uh, pretty good. So what are the indications? Again, uh, the indications are similar to taste, multinodal lesions. And if it is large and if the, there are a number of uh, tumors, the second one is if there is involvement of the portal vein. And obviously you need to have a good liver function status. And if there is a failure of taste, then also tear can be done. And uh, sometimes it is also used for downstaging of tumors to bring them into the criteria for transplantation. Uh, the major contraindications are advanced liver disease. And if you have a high lung shunt fraction, and if there is a massive of infiltrating HCC replacing the whole liver. And obviously you don't need to have renal cardiovascular or lung comorbidities when you're doing tear. So there are certain complications which can be associated with tear and also with the uh, taste. Post embolization syndrome is one, which has been reported with both and in which you can have fatigue, abdominal pain and the fever. Then non-target embolization, non-healing radiation ulcers in the GI tract and uh, radiation pneumonitis has also been reported. Uh, you can also have hepatotoxicity. Uh, you can have drop in the WPC counts and you can cause biliary and gallbladder injury as well and radiation pneumonitis as I said earlier. So what are the results? Pretty good results with uh, transarterial uh, radioembolization also. Survival comparable to taste, maybe a little better, shade better I would say. And uh, how do you differentiate? Uh, what are the points which differentiate between taste and tear? Uh, taste is uh, kind of contraindicated in main portal vein thrombosis, well tolerated even with portal vein thrombosis tear. And there is an increased risk of post embolization syndrome, especially with conventional taste as compared to depth taste, and it is less as compared to taste in tear. Uh, systemic side effects are slightly more with taste and comparative less with tear. Cost effect, taste is more cost effective, it is pretty cheap as compared to tear. Yttrium is really costly, but rehenium is little cheap. And risk of ischemia is uh, there, but there is no ischemic effects with tear. And uh, as I said earlier, contraindication of tear is if there is a lung shunt fraction of more than 20%. Efficacy wise, both are comparable and can be used uh, either ways. So moving on to the last one, SVRT, stereotactic body radiation therapy. Uh, this is highly conformal technique of external beam radiation therapy. This is external beam radiation. The other one was going into the liver and you deliver high radiation doses in a small number of fractions, which cause the cell to die. And due to the sharp dose gradients outside the target volume, limited dose uh, to the adjacent organs at risk is to be given. And 85% of the local control rates at uh, two years after SBRT has been reported. So now this technique has really improved and you tend to focus on primarily on the tumor and hardly any radiation is given to the normal tissue outside the tumor. Again, indications are similar to taste and uh, or tear, I would say. HCC with a maximum diameter of five to six centimeters, not eligible for resection 
or other therapies and lesions located close to the liver surface where you feel that other therapies cannot be done or if there is a portal vein thrombosis and uh, it is obviously unsuitable for lesions which are close to the small bowel or the stomach and uh, the patient should have good liver functions and up to five lesions this therapy has been tried and you need a good platelet count and uh, obviously the liver uh, volume should be good and uh, a repeat sbrt can be considered for new lesions which have not been previously irradiated and uh, time interval should be preferably 6 months or longer and what are the various studies which have uh, done a comparison of this just to show you that good survival and when you compare sbrt with all other procedures survival uh, one year around varying from 50 to 90% and overall survival is pretty good here also it is equally there are some studies which have shown that it is equally effective as rfa for small tumors and maybe even superior for to rfa for more than 2 cm uh, tumors where rfa cannot be done and the only issue is that the radiation uh, injury which can happen to the normal tissue also so how do you really assess response in local regional therapy the this one is the easel guidelines the resist guidelines were primarily being used and you now have the modified resist just to show you that initially they were looking at the decrease in the size of the lesion now we are looking at the viability of the tumor and the progressive disease is when there is increase in at least 20% of the sum of the diameters of the viable tissue viable tumor and uh, this is the comparison of different local regional therapies this is just to summarize surgery tumors less than 5 percutaneous ablative therapies less than 3 tears is 3 to 5 cm here you include tear and uh, uh, you can include tear also and sbrt around the same size of lesion uh, so number of tumors less than 3 depends on the location percutaneous ablative therapies and multiple tumors can be taken care in tears and in sbrt it is usually less than 1 to 3 3 and location or characteristic will uh, depend on the liver functions if it is centrally located then you might not be able to do surgery and it in percutaneous ablative procedures the the lesion should be away from the major vessels or from the biliary system and uh, in tays it has to be high hypervascular lesion and in sbrt it has to be away from the bowel and the stomach and local control pretty good in all of uh, these therapies level of evidence is high for surgery and intermediate to high for uh, percutaneous ablative therapies again it is intermediate to high for tays and sbrt the evidence is low it is evolving and it is being used more and more frequently now and if you look at the invasiveness high for surgery obviously you need to undergo a surgical procedure but cutaneous ablation very less and tays is also less and in sbrt there is no invasiveness so this is the advantage of sbrt and it's being used in patients who have other comorbidities especially like cardiac and pulmonary issues where rfa or cryo or microwave cannot be used and damage to the liver high with surgery obviously percutaneous it's low and taste it can cause ischemic injury it is low to moderate and again with sbrt it is low to moderate so ladies and gentlemen i would like to conclude by saying management of hcc has to be individualized you cannot have Uh, therapies directed to all the patients similar therapies directed to all the patient it has to be individualized and local regional therapies cover a broad spectrum of therapeutic indications if the proper selection of candidates is followed it represents a safe and effective treatment with improved survival thank you very much for your patient listening yeah thank you so much uh, dr kanaja wonderful talk very clear and clear message to the students so i think there was one question in the chat box that why tays is contraindicated in portal vein thrombosis if you can elaborate though dr yashwant has uh, put in the chat box the answer also so yeah. if you can elaborate please yeah so obviously you know once you are going into the liver through the arterial supply okay so primarily the supply to the liver is by either the portal vein or through the hepatic artery so if the portal vein is already okay. blocked and you are going through the hepatic artery and blocking that also then the whole supply to the liver will go and it will cause ischemic damage to the liver so that is why they see that you should not attempt in the main portal vein thrombosis right so i think uh, there are no more questions so i request you sir to be a part of the panel also yes. and uh, i invite dr manish jain to moderate the panel which is uh, on again the liver directed therapies in hepatocellular carcinomas 
and i would like to invite the eminent faculty for the panel dr partha uh, s chaudhary who is from rgci dr taneja we know and uh, dr yashwant patidar who is from ilbs dr arvind from uh, ester rv hospital bangalore yep. dr rajat bajaj who is a medical oncologist from fortis noida and dr arun singh moses who is from tmc kolkata so i welcome you all and uh, dr manish jain please take over for the panel uh yeah dr manish jain is our gi onco surgeon so he will be moderating the panel uh, uh thank you dr shefali and uh, i welcome to all the eminent panelist uh, dr sunil dr sunil tanijat he has taken a very excellent lecture he has done our job very easy actually because it is because he has explained most of the things in very simple language and uh, in our panel discussion what we can do is like we can discuss two or three cases uh, in the similar case scenarios which mostly he has discussed and we can take it like like a tumor board discussion and we can try to find out what can be the best individualized plan for this uh, uh, patient so let me share my screen first Uh, Dr. Manish, please make it full screen. Yeah, yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Okay. One second. Okay. Yes. Uh, so let me first. Uh, uh, inter means already Dr. Taneja has uh, introduced the topic and he has uh, taken a very good lecture. So whenever we manage the Uh, these uh, when, whenever we manage scc uh, few things we have to keep in mind first thing is always the intention of the treatment whether it is a curative treatment palliative treatment down staging treatment or some kind of a bridge treatment to a liver transplant uh, therapy and second important thing which always come into consideration is the accessibility means uh, what uh, uh, the presence of expertise if we are planning for tear the expertise should be available sbrt again hifu and uh, electroporation all these technologies are not present in all the centers and then the affordability uh, definitely and what is the evidence whenever we compare these uh, modalities uh, uh, we we say that they improve the survival then what is the evidence for for these agents so let's discuss case by case uh, first case will be as Uh, a, a similar kind of a situation which dr taneja mentioned in his initial few slides uh, a small very early small lesion in uh, in the liver so he was a 73 year old gentleman who was diabetic hypertensive bmi of 30 ps uh, uh, ecog 0 and he was evaluated outside for dyspepsia and bloating sensation there is no history of any alcohol intake hepatitis b c negative there was a history of upper gi bleed 3 years back which was treated again outside at uh, kanpur that time esophageal varices was uh, diagnosed grade 2 and 3 and evl was done there is a history of altered sensorium 3 months back query achieve again managed uh, locally blood investigations uh, platelet was 86000 liver function test bilirubin was 1.32 enzymes were slightly raised albumin was uh, maintained 3.73 an ultrasound of the abdomen was showing cirrhotic liver with a small hypodense lesion in segment 3 size of 2 into 1.5 cm so we did an mri of the abdomen it showed uh, ill defined small hyper intense nodule measuring 10 into 7 mm in segment 3 of the liver there is a mild enhancement on late arterial phase showing iso intense signal on equilibrium phase and mild hypo enhancement on Five minutes venous phase and delayed hepatobiliary uh, uh, phase image. There was no definite evidence of any capsular enhancement, no evidence of any intraglandular steatosis. So it was labeled as Lyrets three uh, lesion, a small lesion, ten uh, one centimeter lesion, and AFP was two point three two. So primarily he he was child say cirrhosis Nash with small lesion segment three query SCC with portal hypertension. There is a history of bleed and query HG. Uh, so let's. Involve first our surgeon, Doctor Arvind, if he is there. Doctor Arvind, 
do we have means uh, dr arvind has joined or yeah let me see uh... Uh, no i can't see his name here in the yeah so okay so dr sunil dr sunil uh, so this is an mri picture which showed a mild enhancement in delayed arterial phase with some uh, uh, wash out at delayed very delayed phase 5 minutes and 5 minute phases so lyrates three lesions means how do you actually uh, uh, treat them observation versus treatment this is the first question which comes to the mind yeah i think it's a very small lesion and uh, uh, if it is not classical of hcc then you can just wait and repeat an imaging after 3 months and see okay so uh, so he's uh, so what kind of imaging same imaging mri or any other uh, would you like to re- uh, do another contrast yeah, obviously as i told you in in my presentation also if, if there's any doubt then you need to do another cross sectional imaging which includes a triphasic ct scan and see whether it is actually the same or it is something else so if it is a larger lesion or if it is direct 4 or 5 then obviously i would like to treat it as it's a cm okay so this was the imaging was reviewed by two or th- uh, two radiologist according to one radiologist it was lyrates 3 and means uh, other was saying lyrates 4 that so there was a, always a doubt between lyrates 3 and 4 and uh, 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 dr rajat dr rajat bajaj He is there, medical oncologist. He is medical oncologist yeah. from uh, Fortis. Hello. Yeah, he should be here. He was joining. Yeah, he should be here. He was joining. Uh, Doctor Rajat. Yes, yes, uh, <clears throat> yes. Am I audible? Am I am there? Yeah. yeah, you are. You are audible. Yeah, Doctor, you are. Audible. What What will be your uh, What will be your approach in such kind of scenarios? Uh, would you like to observe these patients? as per the assld guidelines or would you like to treat them now because patient is having portal hypertension maybe uh, after few months the lesion grow in size then he may not be amenable for any kind of ablative procedure uh, so what will be your approach in such kind But of I, yes i will first like to review the uh, the images which have been given Uh, because uh, it is very possible like i think you yourself pointed out that one of the uh, radiologist was in the favor of giving it as lyrates 4 yes. uh, because like the description that you have given and of course you have uh, just shown one image which is the arterial uh, imaging arterial and photo uh, i yeah so uh, i believe that uh, if it is lyrates 4 definitely that leaves a little doubt uh, on the fact that we should uh, try and uh, uh, get it get this treated by a liver directed therapy preferably uh, it it should be uh, you said it is 3 cm right no no one 1 uh, cm okay one okay so preferably it should be resection uh, but if it is lyrates 3 in the even, even the second opinion says that it is lyrates 3 then uh, also because the patient is having a ps of 0 as of now and uh, the other parameters are also stable it, there is a risk that these patients may deteriorate in terms of their able to offer liver i not like to observe and uh, confirm this as hcc first and then uh, try to uh, involve uh, my uh, you know uh, interventional radiologist colleagues and uh, get this treated okay so uh, resection versus ablation in this scenario uh, as we know uh, this patient is having some uh, signs of portal hypertension uh, what will be the preferred approach dr sunil yeah i think obviously uh, ablation has shown equally good results as compared to resection and if you have evidence of portal hypertension then i would go with uh, ablation yes. so this patient uh, is a candidate for uh, ablation and uh, anyone for means uh, uh, for resection i think the uh, the take away message should be that you really need to confirm the lesion first whether it is lyrate 3 or 4 and if it is 4 i would just treat it as hcc only give the benefit benefit of doubt to the patient okay. so i don't want to wait for another 3 months and let it grow 
or maybe six months and let it grow to size where I might not be able to give him some kind of therapy and he decompensates and develop further complications of foot pain. Yes. And, and for Lyrates 3, what will be your approach means in su such case scenarios where... I think patient... obviously it's a very small lesion. I would wait for three months and repeat another Okay. Okay. So, uh, and... Uh, uh, wait, wait something. There is discrimination of size in ultrasound report and MRI. Yes. So, so there is a discrepancy, but uh, mm. MRI was more spe means uh, the ultrasound. I think we have to take the MRI report as uh -huh. because it was very uh, clearly visible. Uh -huh. Second imaging, either ultrasound uh, contrast or CT. Okay. If you are in uh, hurry, otherwise wait for MRI. Second follow-up MRI one or two month, not for three month. Three month too late if uh, ultrasound shows size more than the approx three centimeter. Right. So, Dr. Yashwant, what kind of ablative procedure has Dr. Sunil told that most of the literature is on percutaneous ethanol injection? Uh, do you think that it is of historical importance now and RFA is a treatment of choice? Uh, now, percutaneous ethanol ablation is uh, of historical importance and RFA or micro, whatever you have in your setup, are equally efficacious for this religion. Okay, so how will you select your patients for RFA, particularly the lesions which are uh, uh, near the surface. Uh, can we do RFA for these lesions? If a lesion is uh, up to 50% of diameter is uh, encircled by the liver, then it is have equal efficacy as compared to intraparenchymal lesion. So this lesion is clear cut in the intraparenchymal location. Okay. Up to 50% of the liver diameter, uh, lesion diameter is uh, encapsulated by liver, then efficacy is equal in literature. Okay, so RFA results as uh, were shown by in the previous presentation uh, also that the literature favors that uh, for RFA, particularly for the lesions less than or equal to two centimeter, the efficacy uh, long-term outcomes, particularly three-year survival rate in one study was found to be 91%. It is equivalent to uh, surgical resection. As this patient was not a, a surgical candidate and RFA is equally effective for uh, such a small lesion. So RFA was done for this uh, patient and uh, this is the image post RFA. Uh, we have already discussed RFA versus percutaneous ethanol injection. Both are equivalent. And how do you follow these lesions uh, post RFA, Dr. Reshwant? Usually uh, always one month follow up. Uh, image which are uh, prior to ablation is available. If CT okay. or MR, and okay. if MR is available, it is very uh, good to do follow with the MRI. And after one month, every three months in first year and every six months in second year. So we have to do MRI every three months for first year? First or year. ultrasound is enough? No, no, MRI or CT. MRI or CT. Contrast imaging after ablation at one month and then every three months. Uh, uh, MRI or CT scan. Dr. Sunil, uh, is there any difference of opinion? In, uh, no, uh, let me just clarify here. One month you're doing the imaging study to see if there is any restoration lesion which, yes, is yes. Hand, which you really want to take care. Okay, yes. So if it is there, then you can maybe repeat a procedure or whatever. So we would also do it at three months and three, as Dr. Yeshwant has said that three months for the first year, every three months and after that it can be six months. Um, uh, MRI or CT scan? Yes, yes. It's, it's always a cross-sectional imaging. Once you have diagnosed HCC in any patient, because yes. obviously ultrasound is observer dependent and you know, you might not pick up small lesions which mm -hmm. are there and uh, cross-sectional imaging is any time better than ultrasound for HCC detection. Okay. So let's move on to our second case. I just want to confirm whether Dr. Arvind has joined or not. Dr. Shafali, can you please confirm? Yeah, I'm just uh, searching. I think I can't see... Uh... This complete name. Mm, I don't think. I oh, okay. Uh, let's yeah. uh, let's let's discuss our second case. So he was a forty-five year old uh, gentleman. He was non-alcoholic, hepatitis B C negative, BMI of twenty-two, and he was evaluated outside for pain, upper abdomen, and loose stools. There was no history of any jaundice, GI bleed, altered sensorium, or any blood transfusion or any past surgical intervention, with a good performance status, and. Uh, on abdomen examination was uh, absolutely normal, no ascites, no splenomegaly. 
ultrasound of the abdomen was done uh, outside which was showing cirrhotic liver with hypodense lesion in right and left uh, both both the lobes of the liver largest size was 3 into 5 cm and upper gi endoscopy was done which was which was suggestive of grade 3 varices three columns and ct abdomen uh, he was carrying with him it was it was not a very good quality study it was showing a large scc 5 cm in segment 2 3 4 with a tumor thrombus in left portal vein right portal vein and extending into the uh, main portal vein uh, the afp was uh, uh, high it was uh, uh, 1419 ca 99.9 ca all were normal platelets was normal inr was 1.07 liver function test was well preserved so it, he was again uh, uh, cld child's a with uh, portal hypertension non bleeder with multifocal scc and uh, with uh, uh, portal vein thrombosis so this was the mri which was done at our center which was showing ill defined altered signal intensity areas in left lobe of the liver showing t1 hypo intense c2 hyper intense signal with diffusion diffusion hyper intensities there was a mild patchy enhancement on arterial phase patchy areas of washout seen in subsequent delayed phases and this lesion in the left was uh, having an exophytic component as well uh, the uh, there was a contiguous signal extension is in the left portal vein the right portal vein and into the main main vein and it was showing arterial enhancement so it was a tumor thrombus and there were multiple prominent periportal vessels collaterals basically in addition to this there were two other smaller lesions nodular lesions and uh, 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 right lobe of the liver that was one in the segment 8 uh, measuring 12 mm another was in segment 5 6 junction so i can show on the other images this is the right portal vein which was showing the thrombus and this is the main portal vein the main portal vein thrombus was extending uh, just uh, this supra pancreatic part only and this was the another lesion in the segment 5 6 junction and segment 8 lesions were there in the right lobe of the liver so multi focal bilobar disease uh, 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 dr sunil what should be the intent of treatment in these patients where these patients lie as bclc stage with photo vein thrombosis you know this is a big multi focal hcc and which has involved the uh, main portal vein also so this would uh, fit into the advanced stage of hcc and obviously treatment cannot be uh, curative in this and uh, it has to be palliative only it it has to be palliative so uh, patient was in the advanced stage of the uh, advanced stage as per the bclc only thing was that performance status was very good he was young with no comorbidities and uh, and so uh, we can uh, doctor uh, doctor choudhury is there uh, from rajiv gandhi cancer institute he is a uh, head of uh, nuclear medicine department dr chaudhary yeah, i think yeah he's there yeah, yes sir so can we sir what kind of uh, treatment we can plan for this patient the main question which comes to our uh, mind in these kids scenarios is taste versus tear uh since this is an advanced stage and it has a portal vein thrombosis so since taste is a contraindication for portal vein thrombosis uh probably ideally it would be the drug treatment should be better in this advanced stage mm -hmm. but of course tear can also be uh, tried out in case we the pre uh, treatment in imaging doesn't show any uh, say shunt or more than the, in the lungs or in the okro khana banate okro khana banate okay okay so this okay doctor doctor yashwant can i uh, can i ask you means is tes is means is portal vein thrombosis is an absolute contraindication for main portal vein thrombosis is an absolute contraindication for tes or should we take okay. multiple two three factors into account particularly the liver function and the size of the tumor and the location of the tumor can we do tes uh, in these scenarios as well because tear may not be available at all the centers So in this patient, uh, absolutely uh, the first uh, uh, first treatment modality is tear, but TACE also can be included in management option. TACE versus SBRT is best second option, 
and third is only taste with the sorapnik or something uh, if liver is child a and is in this patient and if periportal periportal collateral are present then taste can be go uh, taste can be indicated in the pvt La important is that uh, it's this taste should be done by the good expert hand that uh, there is any no 0% chance of hepatic artery injury okay very super selective taste of the lesion only not the liver so according to you what are the absolute contraindications for taste absolute contraindication for taste is a uh, child b late child b patient mm -hmm. having ascites motor ascites late child b child b at the time of present time of present and patient and mild to moderate ascites and no periportal collateral at the time of uh, treatment okay so uh, dr choudhary what uh, what are the uh, means how do you actually select your patients for tear particularly uh, so first is the uh, clinical staging and the other investigations when you uh, confirm that this patient is having an uh, hcc and obviously the very small tumors and other things are excluded they go into other uh, easier local therapies and whatever we the indications we have said that a multifocal hcc and uh, good liver function decompensated uh, not much decompensated function the most important is that we need to establish that there is no uh, hepatopulmonary shunt because if there is hepatopulmonary shunt that can really cause lung injury and uh, it can also cause injury to the eye. so first the tear is done in two parts one is the part one is the feasibility of tear or selecting the patients for the tear so what we use is we use a macro aggregated albumin and mm -hmm. it's it's sort of a theranostic approach where you use a diagnostic modality to check that uh, the macro aggregated albumin is localizing into the area of interest that is the tumors whether you cannulate uh, whether the intervention radiologist cannulates the main uh, hepatic artery or super selective artery depending on what uh, which areas we are treating so similarly then we inject the macro aggregated albumin in the part 1 tear and then you do the spec ct scan we shows you the distribution as well as it shows you the distribution in non areas of interest so that is the mostly the hepatopulmonary shunt and if there are other uh, arteries which have been say gastroduodenal or other arteries which is going to the the microaggregate albumin is going to the uh, say stomach or somewhere so we quantify that and if the shunt is uh, if it is more than 20% we calculate then obviously it's a contraindication for tear and uh, depending on how much the shunt is whether it is uh, 10 to 15% or less than 10% or no shunt accordingly the dose of uh, atrium 90 either terospheres or surspheres are uh, modulated okay so can means uh, definitely there is an advantage of tear over taste in patients with portal vein thrombosis so uh, can we do uh, this procedure in patients with the, like as dr yashwant told that tes will be absolutely contraindicated in late uh, child b or child c patients can we do tear can we offer them tear in such kind of scenarios or I think, tear is yes. i think we can offer them if the otherwise the patient is suitable by pre tear investigation that which uh, which we call the tear part 1 then tear can certainly be offered to these patients okay so as one of the uh, as there was one of the question in chat box so what was the what is the reason can if you can elaborate for the students what is the reason why tear is not contraindicated in portal vein thrombosis and tes is contraindicated why tear is not contraindicated one of the uh, student has asked actually in chat box uh, see portal vein thrombosis again we need to establish how much that portal vein thrombosis is contributing to the tear contraindication if there are no shunts there is no uh, other uh, say uh, vascular supply to the other organs which are not the target organs so in that case definitely since we have a pre treatment imaging and we know that uh, it's going to the organs of interest 
then mm. uh, that's why tear can be offered. So if you look at taste, then uh, as Dr. Yashwan said, if there are periportal circulation is possible, then in a portal vein thrombosis, even tear, uh, taste can be offered. Taste can be offered. If it is done super selective uh, cannulation. It's, super, it's a super selective cannulation. Yes. So this patient, uh, uh, so if we compare, if we compare taste versus tear data, actually, so we have three small randomized control trials, very small sample size from 25 to 40 patients with different, different primary outcomes and point. So, and there was a meta-analysis and there was a heterogeneity of the patient. So according to this, tear and taste provide similar outcomes in unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma. That role of tear uh, means if we uh, do it for same indications, definitely if means uh, they have not analyzed it for portal vein thrombosis. And uh, so this patient was planned for taste followed by SBRT as the lesion was in the left lobe of the liver, right lobe was normal, liver function test was normal and uh, patient was uh, good performance status young patient so he was planned for taste followed by sbrt uh, so dr arun singh so how uh, means uh, how do you see like sbrt has a role here or uh, what is the role of sbrt in uh, such lesions yeah so i think uh, this is one area i think where there is at least uh, some low level of uh, level of evidence that has been generated in uh, terms of usage of SBRT for HCC. So uh, there's at least one small randomized trial which has uh, shown that uh, there is a definite benefit of uh, adding SBRT or radiotherapy to uh, taste in this setting. So it is done in a sequential manner. So you just, uh, like you men, uh, mentioned for this patients, you do taste and then uh, we, we uh, uh, incorporate SBRT as well later on with, uh, within a few weeks after the first sitting of taste. And that definitely gives a better uh, local control. Okay, so SBRT in combination with TACE, uh, uh, do you have like any data which is supporting combination of the treatments over SBRT alone? No, so there is nothing uh, um, uh, compared with SBRT alone. What I mentioned was uh, TACE versus TACE plus SBRT and that has been shown to be uh, better. But better not, than, uh, okay. Yeah. Better so than SBRT, yes. So definitely SBRT has uh, got an upcoming role in most of the uh, scenarios as we can see uh, this uh, from the BCLC staging that whenever the lesion is unsuitable for resection, transplant or radio frequency ablation, definitive RT can also be given. RT can be used as a bridge to transplant and whenever it is unsuitable or refractory to taste, definitive RT can be given. For portal invasion, definitive RT and sorafenib. And for even for stage D patients, symptomatic low dose RT uh, can be offered. So, uh, so SBRT versus TAIR means uh, uh, how do you compare these modalities, Dr. Arun Singh? Uh, definitely TAIR would be delivering much higher doses of radiotherapy and, uh, uh, and we cannot directly compare the dose of radiotherapy. I'm not uh, sure if there are direct comparisons again um, as to the outcomes uh, between the two. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, do you means uh, uh, do you think that tear is a better modality than uh, SBRT? Uh, see, there as uh, Dr. Arun said, there has been no direct comparison uh, which is available in the literature. But when you look at tear, the tear is more specific delivering more, much more uh, level of radiation and at a specific site. So probably if we go by say logic, the tear should be in a properly selective patient, tear should be uh, better as far as outcome is concerned. But as I said, there is no direct comparison available. And uh, in my opinion, probably it cannot be compared because the uh, delivery of radiation is entirely different when you talk in terms of SBRT and when you talk in terms of tear. I, I may be wrong, but that is, uh, think probably it may not be yes. comparable. Yes. yes, you are true, sir, that there is no head-to-head -head comparison between SBRT and tear, particularly for SCC. Uh, so, Dr. Arun Singh, how do you select your patients for SBRT? What are the... Uh, uh, indications and contraindications for SBRT particularly? 
in, uh, any um, indication that is for TACE uh, would, would be definitely an indication for SBRT as well. The, uh, um, I would rather say the contraindications are that uh, uh, we need to have uh, um, good liver function. So any uh, childhood be um, eight or over is contraindicated. And uh, uh, so what we call as the normal liver, that is the uh, non-tumor uh, volume should be uh, um, at least 700 or 800 cc. And we should be able to achieve the dose constraints. Uh, uh, we look at the mean dose to the liver, the normal liver and also uh, the dose constraints to the nearby uh, organs like the small bowel and uh, stomach and all those. Uh, if, if they are very nearby, then they might end up getting high doses of radiation. So if uh, provided all these technical uh, um, constraints are met, we, we will be able to deliver uh, good doses of radiotherapy. Okay. So is there a, uh, something like uh, SBRT, uh, particularly in portal vein thrombosis, can it be like... Uh, 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 does it include liver tumor volume as well as the main portal vein tumor or it can be given only to the tumor, uh, uh, the tumor thrombus in the portal vein if the main tumor volume is very large in size? We, we can give kind of the uh, portal vein as, alone um, as a palliative procedure that is also feasible. Okay, so th that, can, uh, that can also be given as a palliative procedure. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajat, uh, so uh, what is the role of uh, sorafenib? Uh, means, uh, how do when when would you like to include these these agents into the treatment? So, uh, sorafenib or for that matter, lenvatinib uh, are the first line treatment options for patients uh, in hepatocellular carcinoma who have an unresectable disease and where a liver directed therapy or a local um, uh, you know tumor directed therapy cannot be offered this is mostly as you uh, very rightly said in your previous slides also is uh, bclc advanced stage that is stage c uh, when the patient has got a preserved uh, child puke status that is an early child puke status of a and early b this is uh, where the role of serafinib and lenvatinib comes into play so should we combine it with the liver directed therapies or uh, it should be used only when uh, nothing is possible like liver directed therapies also is not possible or it can be combined as a first line treatment with the uh, liver directed therapies particularly taste or tear so see uh, the combination of uh, of the systemic try tyrosine kinase inhibitors with the liver directed therapy is not something which you will find as a standard of care in the guidelines but uh, certainly there is a lot of evidence, a lot of data to suggest that a combination, if in a properly selected patient it is used, it helps in uh, improving the survival as well as the quality of life. So many a times we, we as a medical oncologist, uh, uh, you know, understand that sorafenib or lenvatinib, uh, they do not have... Uh, magical response rates, both in terms of the depth of response as well as the time to, to respond. So if the patient is having a symptomatic disease, there is a, a tumor which is which is uh, causing a causing pain or for, for that matter, a, a biliary obstruction, then uh, I will be happy to uh, give this patient uh, to my interventional radiologist who can do a liver directed therapy and simultaneously put this patient on systemic therapy. Okay. Uh, but then, uh, like I said, the guidelines do not recommend a combination. And right. if the patient is having an advanced uh, stage in BCLC, that is stage C and beyond, and if there is a preserved uh, performance status, then uh, the systemic therapy is the way forward. What are what are the uh, uh, selection criteria? Like uh, uh, what child status you can give it, it as a first line agent? Can we give it in child C, like child C or late B? No. No. So the guidelines very clearly recommend that in child to C it should not be given. The best child to uh, staging to give it is A, and it can also be early B. When I say early B, I mean B seven. And in your practice, uh, uh, like lenvatinib is preferred over sorafenib, or or uh, so, is there any difference in yeah, the so, these uh, drugs? 
if i talk about the differences between lenvatinib and sorafenib so uh, we have the sharp trial for sorafenib and reflect trial for lenvatinib first we have to understand that uh, sorafenib has been there for years together now it was approved in 2006 or 7 and uh, uh, lenvatinib after that was approved about 5 6 7 7 years after the approval of sorafenib so there is more of data more of evidence and more of experience with sorafenib but the very reason why there was a need for any other tki to come to the fore uh, was because sorafenib has got uh, its its own toxicity especially if you are giving it full dose very rarely have i been able to offer sorafenib to a patient of hcc in the full dose of 800 mg per day so we see the toxicity of hand foot syndrome mucositis fatigue uh, all these things they are very common with the full dose to the tune of about 50 to 60% uh, having said that in the in the sharp trial uh, sorafenib did very well for for asian subset of patients uh then then if we talk about lenvatinib lenvatinib has got if you do a, a a a comparison between the two although a cross trial then uh, the response rates are similar but with a lesser toxicity with the better quality of life and a better tolerance so just because of this particular reason my preferred drug nowadays in in the first line setting in uh, metastatic or advanced hcc blend so and what is the role of immunotherapy in uh, hepatitis lo carcinoma is there any role as a first line agent or that, that should be used as second line or third line so when the immunotherapy came into being in hcc it was it started with second line and uh, there was approval of uh, of nivolumab in the second line post progression on sorafenib but after, uh, but it it has been like one and a half two years when uh, recently immunotherapy has been approved for first line as well and uh, i'm talking about the combination of immunotherapy that is atezolizumab which is a pdl1 inhibitor with a vegf inhibitor which is bevacizumab we have to carefully select patients uh, who have to be on this uh, a combination but this combination has seen to have has been seen to have superior uh, response rates uh, very early into this particular study we we still are uh, but but superior response rates and uh, a better tolerability okay but cost is always an issue with uh, immunotherapy cost is a huge issue definitely it is not something which everybody can afford and mm-hmm. the cost benefit ratio should also be seen definitely yes so this patient underwent uh, deptase in september 2020 the, that left sided last tumor was supplied by left hepatic artery and two smaller lesions in segment 8 supplied by right hepatic artery branch selective cannulation at dr yashwan told that selective cannulation of these vessels were done and then uh, tase was done following which an mri was done after one month which showed non enhancing cavitatory lesion in this segment 2 and segment 8 lesion also was non enhancing but the segment 5 and 6 lesion was not uh, targeted that time because of the risk of uh, uh, overdo in one sitting uh, so uh, the but the main thing was that uh, after first stage only and the patient was also started on lenvatinib after first stage only the signal that the portal vein thrombus thrombus was uh, uh, was not not uh, was hypo enhancement was showing on arterial and venous phase so another test was done in october 2020 uh, that time only selective cannulation was done for right hepatic artery supplying segment 5 6 lesion and uh, this patient had a very good response after two test procedure and then this patient also underwent uh, uh because of the down staging effect also underwent a liver transplant in december 2020 and till now follow up uh, just a couple of days back only his mri was done uh, so till now follow up is normal so uh, so dr sunil means uh, do you think that liver transplant can ever be done in these kind of patients means uh, is there any role of down staging particularly when there is a portal vein thrombosis yeah there is data which has emerged now Because if the tumor markers are not to that high level where they can be a very high recurrence rate, the results of liver transplant have been encouraging, but in a very specific select group only. 
Mm-hmm. So the message should be clear that it should be done in a very specific. It should be very selective. Yes. Specific. So not all. Group. Yes. So all not all patients can undergo liver transplant because these patients have very high failure rate, and uh, very selective patients only can undergo liver transplant after downstroke. If you look at the alpha beta-protein levels or at the typical level levels. If you are very high, then I won't suggest doing a transplant for such patients. Right, right, sir, right. And coming to our case three, uh, means this is another case, almost similar type, but uh, uh, the uh, means we'll discuss it. He was a forty-eight year old male uh, with no comorbid comorbidities, non-alcoholic, but with performance status of two, uh, borderline performance status, BMI twenty-one. There was a history of hepatitis C infection, uh, uh, and he was diagnosed and treated treated well few years back. Now he presented with pain abdomen on and off on evaluation by ultrasound abdomen. There was a uh, space occupying lesion in the liver. CT was done, which was showing cirrhotic liver with segment six lesion, six into six into five point eight centimeter. There was a large tumor thrombus in right, left, and main portal vein. PET CT was done, which was suggestive of large FDG avid ill-defined. There was an ill-defined soft tissue lesion in segment six, seven point six into seven point four into eight point three. So maximum dimension was eight point three centimeter with heterogeneous arterial means characteristic of SCC with FDG avid thrombus in right portal vein, left portal vein, and main portal vein. There was no other lesion in the body. AFP was high, nineteen hundred fifty three. LFT was uh, uh, normal, uh, well preserved. Albumin was three point three. Platelet was eighty eight thousand. INR was one point three six. Child's A upper GI endoscopy grade two varices. So again, this was CLD hepatitis B hepatitis C. Sorry, with portal hypertension, non bleeder, with hepatocellular carcinoma in right low prime. That the previous was one was main lesion was right lobe of the liver with albumin thrombosis. So this was this is the PET CT image of this patient with a huge uh, ill-defined mass in the right lobe of the liver with uh, main and right portal vein thrombosis going into the left portal vein as well. Similar question means uh, again I think intent will be again palliative. It cannot be curative in such scenarios. So uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary means again same uh, coming back to you tear versus means uh, should we go for tear or SBRT means uh, performance status two liver function well preserved right lobe liver lesion can we go for tear in these scenarios? Yeah, I think if part A tear, if we see that there is uh, no other contraindication like hepatic shunt or any other uh, non-target lesion uh, influ efflux, then tear can certainly be considered. Yes. So if tear, suppose if tear option is not there because of affordability. And so, Dr. Arun Singh, can we go for SBRT for these large lesions? I mean, uh, uh, looking at the image that you had uh, shown, it looks like the um, normal liver volume is likely to be uh, very less in this patient. So, uh, we might have, uh, we may still be able to do it, at a, um, but not deliver a very high dose and possibly go with a very low uh, palliative uh, dose of uh, treatment. Okay. So we considered it, it for SBRT, but as you rightly said, the volume of the liver was not uh, uh, was very less. So SBRT was ruled out in in this patient. So this patient underwent tear with sorafenib. It was uh, the patient was treated a couple of years back, and uh, but the uh, the effect of tear was uh, very good. But the SBRT was given to portal vein thrombus. Thrombus. Uh, do you think that this this option can be utilized? If portal vein thrombus particularly is not responding to any other modality, uh, yes, that that is definitely an option. And um, um, but post tear the um, um, utility of uh, SBRT there is very um, uh, little reported. I think there are uh, one or two case series that have been reported, and they have said that it is still safe to uh, deliver SBRT in, uh, in a post tear setting. Um, so it can definitely be considered in someone who has residual portal vein thrombus. Yes. So this patient underwent post tear and SBRT. This PET CT showed uh, uh, complete resolution of the lesion, but this patient had uh, two three episodes of decompensation uh, in follow up six months, 
and then then this patient failed actually uh, he had a recurrence in uh, with a, with a left supraclavicular lymph node after 6 months so uh, means to summarize just as dr sunil taneja already mentioned uh, very beautifully in his last slides that uh, the summary like two small sccs particularly less than 3 cm rfa or percutaneous ethanol injection which is normally not used are curative options with the optimal outcomes and comparable with surgical resection and uh, for unresectable sccs who are unsuitable for ablative therapy tase has a survival benefit as compared to best supportive care definitely tase is less effective against very large sccs particularly or less more than 10 cm or scc with portal vein thrombosis portal vein thrombosis as such is not an absolute contraindication we have to see combination of things like performance status of the patient liver function test size of the tumor location of the tumor if it is involving major liver volume uh, right lobe lesions multiple lesions then along with portal vein thrombosis definitely tas is contraindicated in such scenarios but uh, smaller lesions left lobe lesions with well preserved hepatic function tas can also still can be done with portal vein thrombosis with super selective cannulation as dr yashwant has already uh, mentioned and there is a definite role of tear and the indications as dr choudhury said indications for tear is almost same as tase but the advantage of tear over tase is in the patients with who is having portal vein thrombosis and particularly large sccs sbrt has proven its worth in low low cost settings particularly when tear uh, is not available sbrt can be used and it has shown wonderful results we are using it for many patients and it can be used across all scc stages and liver directed therapies can be combined with other multiple liver directed therapies can be combined like dr sunil mentioned in his case scenario which he mentioned that he combined tas plus rfa so these cases has to be discussed in uh, tumor boards what kind of combination therapies we can use and that gives the survival benefit to the patient and these can be combined with tkis or multikinase inhibitor lenvatinib as dr rajat mentioned that it is now considered lenvatinib is considered superior over sorafenib because of uh, uh, better patient tolerance immunotherapy we can use uh, uh, if cost constraints are not there we can use it as a second line therapy anything else i would like to uh, ask my eminent panelist if they would would like to add something in this uh, dr manish you can take up uh, one question which is there in the chat box role of screening in patient at risk of hcc uh, role of screening in patient at risk of hcc is there any proven role of screening what modality can we use the patients who are at high risk for developing hcc so the patients with hepatitis or cirrhosis long standing So, if there is any modality through which, which is approved yes. or tested, yes, definitely there is a role of screening for um, for uh, for uh, for patients who are high at high risk of uh, SCC, particularly uh, hepatitis B and C patients, and the modality of choice is an ultrasound of the abdomen. I would like, means uh, Dr. Sunil, if you can uh, tell us, uh, what is the latest. guidelines for screening protocol in uh, scc in uh, high risk patients all patients with cirrhosis irrespective of the stage should be screened for hcc every 6 months with alpha fetoprotein and an ultrasound so this is the dictum all patients with cirrhosis should undergo ultrasound and alpha fetoprotein uh, levels at every 6 months and uh, obviously there are certain groups where you have high prevalence of uh, hcc hepatitis b in patients who are more than 40 years of age who have family history of hcc and uh, uh, patients who are living in high endemic uh, endemic zones also should be screened for hcc the most important and upcoming issue is nash now so if you look at people who everybody has fatty liver and you are getting more and more patients of nash cirrhosis and there are reports of people getting hcc without going into the stage of cirrhosis also so i think over a period of time the screening for hcc will increase in patients who have 
uh, Nash as well as I think it would be maybe it's it can be a little different as compared to what it is at right now in Nash and Nash cirrhosis also. Yeah, so uh, sir, one question. So, like you said, in patient of Nash, they can progress to uh, a development of HCC without even going to cirrhotic stage. So, is there a role of fibro scan, and can we do it? Uh, I mean, at what stage? Say, fatty liver grade two, grade three. What stage should we start screening in such patient, or do uh, does fibro scan has a role in such kind of patients? So, le le let me tell you that if you look at the general population. And in India, whatever studies are available, around 30 to 50 percent of patients will have fatty liver. Okay, and if they are diabetic and obese, 75 to 80 percent will have fatty liver. So, screening protocols for such a large population cannot be advocated at this point of time. But people say that where there is a high risk, you, where you feel that there are more than one or two risk factors, where there are metabolic metabolic risk factors, and where the ultrasound or imaging shows more than at least grade two fatty liver, then you should be more cautious and maybe do a fibro scan. And uh, actually the problem is that it has to be a cost effective procedure, whatever you do. So if a fibro scan is costing you 5,000 in an outpatient department, then you can't uh, you know, recommend it as a routine procedure. But obviously where there is a higher metabolic factors are there, family history is there of cirrhosis, or if there is a coexistent alcohol history, or there is a past of hepatitis B or C treatment, then these patients need screening. Right, absolutely right. So uh, thank you so much, all of the faculty members, Dr. Manish, everybody for joining in and making us more wiser. And uh, the next session would include uh, the main focus on transplant in primary liver cancers. So I again, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.